So far, we have looked at three different philosophers' uh, political theories, and we focus not all of our intention, but a lot of our intention, uh, a lot of our intention on what they say about justice. So just by way of brief recap, we started with Aristotle. And we looked at Aristotle's views on happiness, on virtue, on justice, on the political community. And we saw how they all kind of come together. Friendship too is in there, right? We saw all these various topics that Aristotle was discussing. And we saw how he kind of integrated them all into his political theory. And they all actually kind of uh, are bound up in his theory of justice. So if you recall very quickly, he claims uh, there are two kinds of justice. There's what he calls uh, justice in the particular sense, and then there's justice in the general sense, general justice. General justice is related to all of virtue. Any virtuous action can be described as just in the general sense. Particular justice, however, is concerned specifically with the goods of fortune, and there are two kinds, uh, and the goods of fortune being things like money and honor and, and so on. Safety is one that he mentions. And there are two kinds of particular justice. There's rectificatory justice and distributive justice. And we spent most of our time on Aristotle talking about how distributive justice works. And one of the things that we saw with it was, it was that it was highly bound up with um, these other theories that he had, particularly when we look at political distributive justice. Because in order to determine what distributive justice requires, you need to know uh, what the good of the relevant community is. <clears throat> and the good of the political community is the happiness of all the citizens. And so happiness, which is, uh, according to Aristotle, is virtuous rational activity. Happiness, virtue, the political community, they all come together in uh, uh, political distributive justice. All right. Then we turned our attention to Hobbes. And Hobbes had very, very different views. And Hobbes is, uh, is and so I called uh, Aristotle's political philosophy something like uh, classical political philosophy. And it had something like it had held sway for hundreds and hundreds of years after the death of Aristotle. When we get to Hobbes, we start seeing attacks on criticisms of Aristotelianism. And Hobbes is one of the arch critics of Aristotle. Uh, Hobbes is critical of Aristotle when it comes to these kind of political matters, but Aristotelianism more generally within the intellectual culture of Hobbes' time, 16th century Europe, Aristotelianism. Uh, is being bombarded with criticisms, not just from political theorists, but from people who do metaphysics, who do natural science, who do epistemology, just from everywhere. Um, Aristotle's kind of coming under attack. And so we've seen Hobbes attacking Aristotle, and more particularly, we saw Hobbes attacking Aristotle's political naturalism. Uh, he denies basically every point of Aristotle's political naturalism. Hobbes doesn't think human beings are by nature social or political. He thinks we're by nature kind of isolated individuals and that it takes some kind of work and it's kind of unnatural to us to <clears throat> come together in some sort of community. And it's only because of the um, uh, ever-present fear of an untimely death in the state of nature that we do come together to make these communities. Otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't bother according to Hobbes. We then saw, and uh, one thing, uh, Hobbes on justice, we saw that come in under the guise of, uh, or under the name of the third law of nature, perform your covenants, right? If you make an agreement to lay down your right to a thing, and somebody else makes a corresponding agreement, keep your agreement. To break your agreement is unjust. That is the entirety of justice, according to Hobbes. What is injustice? It's to break a covenant, period, right? And so Hobbes' account of justice has much less application 
you might think than someone like Aristotle. It's much more limited in scope. You make a promise, keep it. Where that's justice for Hobbes. Whereas for Aristotle, right, justice is far more encompassing. It encompasses um, certainly things like that. You make an agreement, you have to keep it. That would be something that Aristotle would probably refer to as rectificatory justice. Uh, but Aristotle wants to say there's also distributive justice. There's also this thing he calls general justice. And he ties these things into virtues and so on, right? We saw it with distributive justice and we see it with, um, you know, with general justice. Whereas Hobbes, virtue has nothing to do with anything. You make an agreement, keep it. Yeah. So a very different view of justice. We then turned our attention to Locke, <clears throat> who followed very much in the footsteps of Hobbes and maybe kind of made some gestures towards ways in which he was radically different than Hobbes. But as we saw, once we kind of got to the end of our reading of Locke, though he's not as different as he initially presents himself. Locke, we didn't, when we were covering Locke, we didn't talk that much about justice because Locke doesn't really talk about justice. Certainly not in the direct way that both Aristotle and Hobbes did. Nonetheless, Locke has this thing that he calls the law of nature. And he thinks it's binding on us even in a state of nature. And it tells us things like don't murder, don't harm people in their life, liberty and property, don't steal from people, right? Things like that. Don't, uh, don't harm people in their health, don't assault people and so on. And so, and while he never calls this a law of justice or tells us what specifically he means by justice, certainly this law of nature that he describes is bound up with justice. It's a kind of law that requires us to be just. And violations, all perhaps, but if not all, then certainly many violations of the law of nature are going to be instances of injustice. <clears throat> And Locke differs from Hobbes because he thinks that this law is binding on us uh, um, and we ought to follow it and we can follow it even in a state of nature. Now, he thinks people happen not to, right? Most people are degenerate and vicious, and so we have to leave a state of nature and so on and join a political community. But there it is, right? This law of nature. And so we have these three different thinkers thinking about justice. Okay. One thing I want to emphasize at this point is uh, one of the differences between Aristotle or classical political philosophy on the other hand, and then liberalism or uh, modern liberalism, kind of classical liberalism of Locke and Hobbes on the other, because we're going to see this difference continue on into roles, into contemporary li liberalism. As I was mentioning when I was talking about Hobbes, these classical liberals, people like Hobbes and Locke, um, understand their project as being opposed to Aristotle, to classical political theory. Locke would agree. Locke was also a critic of Aristotle. He would agree with Hobbes. And we talked a little bit about the context of uh, both Hobbes and Locke's, uh, the, the context in which they were writing. And I tried to make the case and explain how that context might be important for understanding certain bits of what they're saying. But that context is also important for uh, a further fact, which I haven't described yet. <clears throat> During Locke and Hobbes' time, there were increasing religious tensions. The English Civil War, which uh, Hobbes lived through, the Glorious Revolution, which Locke lived through. Um, we talked about this a little bit when we got to Locke, but those were both, um, there were a lot of things at issue in those conflicts. One of the main things at issue um, was religion. Royalists uh, were kind of uh, allied with the Catholics, the parliamentarians with the Protestants, and we had these conflicts. It wasn't so neat as that. Hobbes was not a Catholic, but he was also a, a royalist. Um, and, ha and Locke wasn't anything like a straightforward by the book Protestant, but he was more or less Protestant, but he was aligned with the uh, parliamentarians. These religious tensions, these religious conflicts, in particular between Catholics and Protestants, um, one way that they were viewed 
by people during Hobbes and Locke's time was as a, as a disagreement over what a good life was. Do you live like the Catholics live or do you live like the Protestants live? How are you supposed to live your life? Right? It was a disagreement, some philosophers thought, over what was good, over what a good life was. One way you can read, especially Locke, is that he is trying to give an account of a political community that doesn't make any, that, does, that doesn't rely on this notion of the good, of what a good life is. Same thing is true of Hobbes. Because one thing you might notice, if you go back and think about Locke and, Locke and Hobbes, they don't talk about the good really much at all. They don't talk about what a good life or happiness or things like that. They don't talk about that hardly at all. Whereas for Aristotle, that was at the very center of his system. And so by the time Locke and Hobbes are writing, with the context that they're in, they see that we, or they think that we need to give an account of a political community of where legitimate political authority comes from that doesn't rely on any substantive notion of the good, that doesn't make use of what a good life is, of what happiness is. And so this is a further reason why they just want to get rid of Aristotle, because Aristotle puts the good, the good life, at the very center of his political theory. Locke and Hobbes are trying to remove the good from any political theory so that we can create a society, a political community that isn't founded on the notion of the good or of what a good life is. So that we can create a society where people with differing notions of the good life can live in peace and harmony, right? Hobbes and Locke are both trying to do that. That's an important difference that we're going to return to in just a second. Now, what I want to draw attention to is the fact that so far, we haven't said anything about social justice. I began the course by saying we were going to focus on these uh, political theories, these kind of uh, big deal political theories, the most influential political theories, the political theories that have influenced the way that we all think today, not just influenced, but in large part determined the way that we all think today. And what we were going to look at, I said, was justice in particular. We're going to focus on this notion of justice. But then when the time arises and from here and then here and there, right, we're going to talk about social justice because that's kind of in the news these days, as they say. So, but what exactly is that? What exactly does adding social on the beginning do? Um, what is social justice? Well, the three people that we've read so far, none of them have used that phrase, right? And so... Where does social justice come from? Where does that phrase, that idea that we use all the time when we're thinking about political issues today, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from, um, you know, as I just said, right? It didn't come from these three, at least not directly. None of them ever said that phrase, either in English or Greek or whatever, right? They never said anything that could be translated as that phrase. The first known instance of the phrase social justice comes not from these three, but from a guy that you probably haven't heard of. That guy. He looks like a, like a Disney movie villain. Uh, his name's Luigi Tapparelli, and he was actually a Jesuit. That's why he's got those kind of funny clothes on, that little hat or whatever. As for the dower expression, I don't know what explains that. I mean, most Jesuits are pretty happy, but uh, apparently not that guy. He was the first person <clears throat> to uh, use that phrase, social justice. And it was in a work he wrote in 1843. It's got a big, long, nasty title. Long and nasty because uh, 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 it's in Italian. It's never been translated in English, and I don't know Italian. Big, long book he wrote. <clears throat> Uh, and, and he used this phrase, social justice. He, he was a political theorist primarily. He was interested in political questions. Um, and he was highly influential on uh, subsequent developments of political theory within the Catholic Church. Um, but what did he 
think about social justice. Who is he drawing on? Was he drawing on Hobbes? Was he drawing on Locke? Was he drawing on Aristotle, somebody else? He was very clearly drawing on Aristotle. <clears throat> Uh, Luigi Tapparelli was a, what is called a Thomist, after uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a medieval philosopher and theologian. Um, Aquinas uh, is often uh, is kind of a crude caricature, but Aquinas is thought of as baptizing Aristotle. Uh, Aquinas was highly, highly, highly influenced by Aristotle and brought on board a lot of Aristotle into his own views. Taparelli is following Thomas. Taparelli, by proxy, then is kind of following Aristotle. And so his view of social justice was basically that it was just distributive justice, as Aristotle had described it, but it's applied specifically to political rights and liberties. That was how Taparelli conceived of social justice. It was concerned with how political liberties, political rights should be distributed to individuals. Now you might think to yourself, well, wait a second, isn't that exactly what Aristotle was concerned with when Aristotle thought about political distributive justice? Yes. Social justice was just another name for what I have been calling political distributive justice, right? But by the time, so why does Taparelli uh, coin this new word? My conjecture, and this is just a conjecture, um, is that uh, by the time Taparelli was writing, and this is true of our day, distributive justice uh, referred primarily, if not exclusively, to the distribution of wealth or money. Certainly today, when we think about distributive justice, we're, we tend to be thinking about things like income uh, redistribution or wealth distributions, inequality in income and wealth and so on. And I think that was probably true of Taparelli's day. And so Taparelli would, uh, uh, would um, use distributive justice just to refer to how things like wealth and money are distributed to the members of a political community. And he coins this new phrase, social justice, to refer to how political liberties, political rights should be uh, distributed by the political community to individuals. Right? And so that's where this phrase first comes from. It comes straight out of Aristotelian political theory. And in Taparelli's view, um, uh, he would bring on board all of that kind of uh, Aristotelian system. The, um, and so in particular, what he emphasizes is the uh, um, relationship between what he calls social justice and the common good. And the common good, of course, as we know from Aristotle, is just the good of the political community, which is just the happiness or flourishing of all of the citizens. And in this, and as we've already seen how uh, we've already seen how distributive justice is related to the common good, Taparelli would bring all that on board when he's talking about social justice, and that's why, according to someone like Taparelli, at least, social justice and the common good go so uh, hand in hand, so closely together. Now, as I've already mentioned, Taparelli, uh, he's not anybody that anyone has really ever heard of. Um, I don't know why exactly. It seems to me, the little I know about him, that he should probably be more well known, but his works haven't been translated in English. That's maybe one reason somebody should do that. Any Italian majors out there, you should go translate his book. Um, he was highly influential on the Catholic Church, as I've been, uh, as I'd said earlier, and in particular on what's called Catholic social teaching. And uh, I believe there are classes you can take in the theology department on Catholic social teaching. Um, <clears throat> but the Catholic Church has uh, uh, a kind of comprehensive theory of a uh, kind of comprehensive political theory really is what you can call it, something like that. Taparelli ends up being hugely influential on the development of that theory, on the development of Catholic social teaching. Catholic social teaching in one form or another takes on board everything that I've, we've been talking about here with social justice and uh, um, 
the common good and so on. Catholic social teaching is highly indebted to Thomas, uh, to Aquinas, to and through Aquinas to um, Aristotle. Um, you know, one way, obviously there's this religious element to Catholic social teaching, but one way to think about it, um, and this isn't entirely inaccurate, is that there is this very, very heavy Aristotelian element to it. Um, anyways, it's a bit of a digression, a uh, bit of a digression. Um, as we have seen in covering Aristotle, however, this theory of justice, and so this view, social justice, it would seem, uh, is highly bound up with the rest of his views, right? All of Aristotelianism, the common good, uh, happiness is virtuous rational activity, et cetera, and so forth, right? Aristotle weaves this highly integrated system, yeah? And as we've also now seen, <clears throat> people like Hobbes and Locke are trying to give an alternative view of politics, of the political community, of society, trying to found a peaceful and harmonious social order on something other than the common good or happiness or what a good life looks like. They're trying to do it on some other basis. Well, now the question is, if you want to get rid of good, the good, from your political theory, can you possibly give a theory of social justice? Could there be a liberal, liberal in the classical liberal sense, right? Could there be a classical liberal theory of social justice? Could there be a Lockean or Hobbesian theory of social justice. And if you focus just on Hobbes, you might think, yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, Hobbes wants to say there's absolutely nothing unjust that a, uh, a ruler, the Leviathan, could ever do to his subjects. That doesn't seem like it's going to afford you much of a basis for whatever it is we want to call social justice. And so you might think the prospects are kind of dim here could there be a liberal theory of social justice? In some sense, we've already seen, as I've been describing, the classical theory of social justice. It's Aristotle's um, view. What would a liberal theory look like? For that, we can't really rely on Locke, and we can't really rely on Hobbes. We're going to move forward in time to this fella, John Rawls who is, uh, by his own lights, a liberal in agreement with people like, ha uh, like Locke in particular, somebody he mentions. He also mentions, I think, Kant and Rousseau. But he's in that vein of political theory. <clears throat> and he attempts, in his book called A Theory of Justice, which is what we'll be reading first, he attempts to give an account of social justice. It's really a theory of social justice. When he talks about justice in a theory of justice, he's talking about social justice. And he makes this fairly clear at the beginning of the work, um, but then throughout the work, he drops the word social and just talks about justice. We're going to be reading A Theory of Justice, which is, by, uh, which is his uh, most well-known work. It's one of the most famous, uh, yeah, I, this seems fair. It's one of the most famous and influential works of nonfiction in the 20th century. Um, we're going to be reading that. There are selections from it. It's a big fat book. We're not reading the whole thing. And we're going to be reading selections from uh, Political Liberalism, which is a later book, his second most important and influential book, um, which was written later in his career. So before we jump into the views, just a brief uh, into uh, what exactly he means by social justice, how it works, right? It's going to be a kind of liberal conception of social justice. Before we see how that works, let's just um, a, give a brief biography of John Rawls. As you might imagine from the photos, right, he's living uh, more uh, closer to our day. He's not alive currently and, and probably won't be in the foreseeable future. Uh, he's born in 1921, dies in, in 2002. Born in Baltimore. He served in World War II as an infantryman. 
he uh, attained a. I'm, I'm not, not a, I'm not a, from a military family or anything like that. I don't know how the ranks work, but he attained the rank of sergeant, I believe, but then disobeyed a direct order. He was ordered to discipline some uh, lower ranking soldier, and he refused to do it because he didn't think the person deserved it. And so they demoted him all the way back to private, and then he left the army or the military. Uh, he was disillusioned with the military, they say. And so what does anybody do when they become disillusioned with the military? They go earn a doctorate in philosophy at Princeton. And that's what he did immediately after uh, serving in the war. <clears throat> and uh, he spent most of it. And so he became an academic. He was a professor. He spent most of his uh, career at Harvard University. Um, and that philosophy department, while he was there, in many ways kind of revolved around him. Uh, he was the most important and influential political philosopher of the 20th century. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, he, uh, he trained some of the most kind of a, uh, uh, influential um, political philosophers alive today. Um, it's hard to overstate the importance of his work, A Theory of Justice, which was published in 1974. Prior to his publishing that book, uh, philosophy didn't, wasn't really concerned with political or social questions, uh, which might seem a little bit odd. You might think political philosophy, that's kind of interesting, and you know we've just read Locke and Hobbes, but through, uh, the, in fact, in the 20th century, prior to Rawls, political philosophy, for whatever reason, had kind of gone out of fashion. And there weren't really people working on it, at least not in the English-speaking world. A theory of justice totally changes that, and it totally revitalizes the, the field of political philosophy. And all political philosophy being done today um, has to, in some way or another, respond to Rawls and to a theory of justice in particular. Political Liberalism, which we're also going to be reading from, was published in 1993. And we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, and he was, uh, as I've already kind of been indicating, he was highly renowned uh, during his life. It was, he wasn't one of those people like, uh, this kind of happened to Nietzsche, if you've ever heard of Nietzsche or Van Gogh. Uh, he wasn't one of those guys who, you know, only became famous posthumously. You no, know, Rawls was a big deal when he was alive. Such a big deal, in fact, that uh, then President Bill Clinton awarded him with um, the National Humanities Medal, right? So recognizing his contributions to uh, political theory. 